Okay, the clock is operating here. All right, so <clears throat> we're almost done. Watch. So what happens? What happens when a person with an allergy is exposed to that allergen? B cells produce antibodies, but the antibodies attach themselves to what? The cell membrane of mast cells. And what do mast cells contain? Good. So where are those antibodies going to head? Where are they going to go? Right, so that's going to be the nose, the eyes. Yep. the allergen. Better get this. These IgE antibodies. Better write this on down. The surface of the mast cells. The mast cells have me? granules containing chemical mediators like histamine and prostaglandins, etc. On exposure, the allergen binds there you to go. the IgE yep. antibodies present Soaking on the on mast something. cell. Here comes now the antibodies are going to go to the area where the allergen entered. That's the nose, eyes stuff. Yeah. And when this pollen, now watch, this ain't going to work. Cross-linking them. This results in the when release this pollen of binds to that and other mediators into the surrounding. When that pollen binds to those antibodies, it's going to cause the mast cells to release histamine. Tell me you got that. I'll do the rest of the drawing because this thing is shot. So watch. Um, so when histamines are released, when histamines are released, these histamines are going to cause the blood vessels, the arteries, arterioles that supply that area to dilate. And it's going to punch, histamines are going to punch holes in the capillaries. So with the vasodilation, where does arterial blood always go? Path least resistance. So more arterial blood is going to go there. So your nose and our nasal cavity and the blood vessels in your eyes are going to dilate. So more blood flow is going to go there. So your nose and nasal cavity get congested and your eyes get puffy. So yeah. And because the capillaries are leaky, fluid from the blood, water from the blood is going to leak out of the capillaries. So your nose and your eyes start running. So what you're actually leaking out of there is the plasma of the blood. That's why because plasma is 0.9% sodium chloride. That's why watery boogers taste salty. Because you're actually leaking the plasma of the blood out. Tell me you got that. Guys? When your boogers dri dripped on, like you're playing outside, right when you were a kid, come on, cut it out. Yeah, being a wise guy, huh? Guys, watch. Watch. What did the histamine cause? And the capillary leakiness. So what do you give for a person who has an allergy? Right, you give them an antihistamine. You better watch out. Antihistamines. 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 Don't do anything for the histamines that were already released. All antihistamines do is prevent the mast cell from releasing more histamines. Tell me you're with me. So you got to do something about the vasodilation of your nasal cavity and your eyes and all that stuff. So what do you take? That's the antihistamine. So you want to take a decongestant. And what do you think a decongestant does? Just think. Yup. 
What does it do to the blood vessels? It constricts them. So watch. You give them a drug that mimics epinephrine. It's called pseudoephedrine or pseudofed. And what does pseudofed do to the arteries in your nose and nasal cavity? That's the decongestant. So watch, I'm going to educate you now. You're going to learn something. If you know someone who has allergies and they have high blood pressure, on the box it says, if you have high blood pressure, talk to your doctor before taking this medication because Sudafed just doesn't constrict the arteries in your nose and nasal cavity. It constricts the arteries all over. Oh, building on prior learning, according to Ohm's flow law, if the arteries were like this, then you took Sudafed because your nose was stuffy. Now all your arteries are going to be like this. And what happens to resistance to blood flow? I'm just going to tell you. It goes up. And therefore your systolic blood pressure goes up. That's why Sudafed makes your blood pressure go up. Right. When you're scared, you got a lot of epinephrine around, so you get shaky. That's why people who don't understand this, they'll take Sudafed at night and then they sit on their bedroom floor rocking back and forth because they can't get to sleep because they're high on a drug that mimics epinephrine. One of the things with Benadryl is this antihistamine quality. It can pass the blood brain barrier and it can affect the reticular activating system and it makes you sleepy. The newer drugs, Allegra, Claritin, right? Those drugs don't pass the blood-brain barrier as easily. That's why there's less sleepiness associated with those drugs. So, yeah. um, you'll still get uh, you'll still get some histamine release, absolutely, but the effects will be much milder. Yeah. So if you know that you're going to be going someplace where there's a potential, you're going to be potentially allergic, then you can take a Benadryl prophylactically. I'm bringing prophylaxis into it. Yeah. How many people follow that? Yeah. Can I show you this? What the hell is going on out there? What is a baby? Hmm. What is for was a student? Watch. If you get, if you have a bee allergy, right? So watch. And the bee stings you. Where's the bee venom going to circulate? All over through your blood. Do you got me? So when your B cells come in contact with that venom, right? You got those memory cells because you got stung before, right? You're going to produce a gazillion antibodies, and those antibodies are going to attach themselves to mast cells. Are you following me? So <clears throat> when those antibodies circulate in your blood and they bind to the B venom, what do the mast cells release? Histamine. And what do histamines do to all of the arteries all over your body? It causes massive arterial vasodilation. Where? Everywhere. And according to old flow law, which people have no idea what I'm talking about, that's sad because that's such a good law. And if you really understood this, when you got in the clinical, life would be so much better. But I can rest easy knowing that I explained it to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Really? Yeah. Yeah, look, those guys, you know, are, and women, 
The only difference between a doctor and not a doctor is um, work. That's really what comes down. These guys aren't like real smart. They're very hard workers. That's what they are. So what's going to happen? Your blood pressure, if all your arteries dilate, going to go down, right? And if you can't maintain a mean arterial blood pressure, systolic blood pressure of at least 60, you can't perfuse your brain and vital organs and you're in shock. What caused the shock? And total body allergic reaction. That's called anaphylaxis. So you are in anaphylactic shock. What's the treatment? Epinephrine. Because epinephrine causes massive arterial vasoconstriction. Where? Everywhere. You have no idea how good that information is. No. Again, this, is, this class is like me going to a fancy French restaurant. I have no idea how good that food is. No. Yeah. No. Okay. <clears throat> Did I do that? Explain how an allergy develops and explain the two medications used to treat it. If you say antihistamines and pseudoephedrine, don't expect a lot of credit. You got me? It says explain. No. Crooked letter I, humpback, humpback I. That's how you spell it. Here we go. Watch it. What's the function of the lymphatic system? One of its functions, I'll just tell you, is the immune system to protect you. Are you with me? All right. Now, all, I would write this down, all lymph vessels must transport lymph through a lymph node before that lymph gets dumped into the central circulation. Yeah. So think of lymph nodes as like security at an airport. It don't make no never mind where you are going or coming from. In order to get your fatty acid on a plane, you have to go through security. So think of the airplane as your heart. The only way that lymph fluid can get back into the right side of your heart is if it goes through security. The security is the lymph nodes. Where do you have lymph nodes? Openings to the body and surrounding the central circulation, right? So all lymph vessels have to dump their lymph through a lymph node before it's dumped into the central circulation. If bacteria gets into the central circulation, you, ha you have sepsis. How many people had um, microbiology? Um, staph? Staphylococcus aureus, yeah, that releases a toxin called endotoxin. Don't write this down. I'm just talking. Update your Facebook status. I'm going to talk to myself. I'm just going to explain it to myself so I know it, right? Endotoxin is a massive arterial vasodilator. So if you get staph into the central circulation and it releases endotoxin, all of the arteries throughout your body will dilate. Resistance to blood flow will drop, blood pressure will drop, and you have shock. What caused the shock? Bacteria into the central circulation. What's the definition of bacteria in the central circulation? Sepsis. You now have septic shock. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. 
Watch it. Um, here we go. I'm gonna knock this out real quick. Uh, yeah, they'll they'll give uh, um, basal constrictors credit, try to keep your blood pressure up. But if you got septic shock on your chart, that's never good. You don't want that. All right. When a woman has a mastectomy, a radical mastectomy, they remove the breast, the underlying musculature, and they do what's called a sentinel node biopsy before they do the mastectomy. They check different nodes, lymph nodes in the area, and they see if there's cancer cells in there. If there's cancer cells in there, then they do a radical mastectomy because they know the cancer has the ability to spread. No, they actually cut in there and they look. They do, yeah, they do, a pathologist looks at that. So when they do that, they remove the axillary lymph nodes and they cauterize the lymph vessels. So if you put a blood pressure cuff on that woman's arm, you pump up the volume, it will force fluid out of the cardiovascular system and what normally takes that fluid back? The lymph vessels. But the lymph vessels were cauterized because you had a radical mastectomy. So any fluid that escapes the cardiovascular system has no way back. That's why you don't take blood pressure on that arm. And the best protection you have against infection is intact skin. If the lymph nodes are removed, the only way that you can, um, if you put a needle in that arm, that bacteria, because it does not being filtered by a lymph node, has direct access to the central circulation. So a needle stick in a woman who's had a mastectomy can lead to septic shock and they can die. That's why. If you ask a nurse, what they will tell you is there's a sign. That's why you don't do it. Then you do it in their feet. You take the blood pressure in their leg. There's a fudge factor. I don't remember it. And you can draw blood out of their feet. Uh, yeah, um, there's some evidence to support the fact that maybe that's overblown, but um, still, if they have another arm, remember, safety, right? So when you get into clinical, if you guys make it that far, just saying, some of you, some of you won't. Some of you won't. What am I saying? Life happens, right? I'm just, okay, everyone in this classroom is going to be a nurse. Uh, yeah, Th that's why uh, that's why nurses go to report, right? And they say, "Oh yeah, this woman had a mastectomy, right?" So, and there's usually a sign there, right? But in a doctor's office, right? You got to ask, you got to know. Yeah, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? No, if uh, if that happens, some people, some women don't develop the lymphedema. That's why when they come out post-surgical, they have a compression stocking on their arm, right? A sleeve, right? To compress that fluid so it doesn't escape the cardiovascular system. That's how TEDs work, right? If you got big legs, you put TEDs on so your legs don't swell. So that's what they do. But in this case, um, if it's a... This woman, that arm is going to be like that the rest of her life. It's never going down. But I'd like to point out, look at the nice Timex you got. It's really nice. No. No. Because then you increase the risk of infection. So that keeps it. So she's got a big arm. Uh, no, it's just, you know, I mean, it's uncomfortable, right? You got this big arm you got to lift around, you know. And it just looks, it almost looks comical. You know what I mean? In the in a sad way, it's like they got like this big blown up finger, like you know, like on a cartoon when somebody hits their hand uh, hand with a hammer and their thumb blows up. That's what it looks like. So that's it. That's how that works. So um, boom. So <clears throat> did I explain? Um, and the basic function of lymph nodes is to filter lymph of any potential antigens or pathogens. Now watch. I shouldn't even explain this to you, but 
کنم I'm just going to explain this to you really quickly. I'm not even going to look. I'm just going to do it. All right. <clears throat> you step on a tack, right? You open up the skin. Because you've damaged the skin, you've damaged a part of your body, the immune system has to come in and repair it. This little tack, it's got some bacteria on it. You got me? What's the function of the immune system? To produce inflammation. How does it produce inflammation? By causing massive arterial vasodilation in the area that was affected. So the arteries that supply that area will dilate and the capillaries will become leaky. So that's why the area becomes red and inflamed, right? And swollen, right? Because more arterial blood's going there, that explains the warmness and the redness, right? And the capillaries become more leaky, so that causes the fluid to leave the bloodstream, go into the interstitial space, the space becomes swollen. Say, yeah. So what do you have in your bloodstream? You're not going to believe this. You have white blood cells, white blood cells. And what do white blood cells do? They go and attack the antigen. Say, yeah. Oh, I don't care. I'm just going to get through this. What will happen, though, is if it's a really nasty infection and the local um, sons of anarchy can't kill it, a white blood cell will eat one of those bacteria and it will take it back through the lymph vessel to the nearest lymph node. And it will say to the lymph node, right? It'll say, hey, where is it? Let's it oh, there it is. It's gonna say to the lymph node, uh, dude, this is a white blood cell, right? And then you got the bacteria that you ate in there. It's gonna say to the lymph node, uh, we're getting our butts kicked down there. Can you help a brother out? And you will start producing specific B cells and T cells that will now go into the lymphatic system, get drained into the right side of the heart, lungs, left side. And because those arteries are dilated, when the left ventricle contracts, it's going to send those specific B cells and T cells to the area of inflammation to attack it and destroy it. How do you know your lymph nodes are making specific B cells and T cells to attack that infection? It becomes swollen and inflamed. That's how you know. And watch. If you have an infection in your foot, where's your nearest lymph nodes? In your groin. If you have an infection in your throat, where are your nearest lymph nodes? Submandibular and what? Cervical lymph nodes. So if you have a sore throat, doctor, ah, look, doctor's going to do this to see if there's lymph nodes involved. If there's lymph nodes involved, the doctor knows it's a pretty severe infection. So they give you a Z pack. If they look in your throat and they don't feel any swollen lymph nodes, lymphadenopathy, they say just go home, your, uh, your lymph system is doing just fine, and you'll work it out. That's really how they decide whether or not they're going to prescribe an antibiotic or not. Or if they have a whiny patient, the whiny patient, well, I'm not leaving until I got my Z pack, and then to shut them up, to write a script and give it to them. That's how it works. So if you have a swollen arm, where's your nearest lymph node? Boom. Did it? Okay. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to go over the different blood types, and then um, you can ambulate home. Does everybody know the blood types? Yep. This will take two minutes. What is it? Uh, just so you know, if you give a patient the wrong blood, you need to work on these words. Would you like some fries with that drink? Because you will lose your license immediately. When you give a patient a, a blood, if you work in a nursing home where they're given blood, right, you have to check everything. 
everything and triple check, double check the whole nine yards. And if you do it wrong, well, they take your license and you'll, <clears throat> that's right. So <clears throat> what I'm about to explain to you is of course, not important at all. It's all about the patella. Here we go. A couple of things that you need to know. And anyone who talks about blood typing before they talk about the lymphatic system clearly doesn't really know how the body works. Of course, I do. That's why I talk about it afterwards. <clears throat> Watch. What's an antigen? An antigen is anything that produces an immune response. So watch. People with type A blood have type A antigenic proteins on the surface of their red blood cell. Preformed when you were born by your immune system are floating in the plasma of a person with type A blood are type B antibodies. You're following this. A person with type B blood has B antigenic proteins on the surface of their red blood cell. And what do they have floating in their plasma? Type A antibodies. You're following this. Do you know this? Do you guys know this stuff? You don't know it? A person with type AB blood has both A and B antigens on its surface. This is the important piece. This is what I would pay attention to. Who's paying attention to this right now, right? A person with type AB blood has no antibodies floating in the plasma. None, nada, nishta, nothing. A person with type O blood is ball-headed. There are no antigens on the surface of that red blood cell. But what type of antibodies do they have floating? A and B. I would write this down. I would really consider having this tattoo. This is no joke. It's so important. You know, I decided I need a vacation. I really do. As soon as the semester's over, I'm taking a vacation. I'm going to go to Las Vegas. Um, yeah, unless I win a lot of money, then no. I need to win $3.2 million. If I can win $3.2 million, <clears throat> I'm out of here. She won $3.2 million? Your sister did? Oh, well, if she wins, I'll marry her. All right, so watch. Watch. Better write this down. Better not pout. To get a transfusion reaction. which is bad for you. You need a specific antigen and a specific antibody. If either one of these criteria are not met, you cannot get a transfusion reaction. Tell me you got that. And again, for people who know what's truly going on, <clears throat> I'm going to explain something to you, and this is really important. Rarely. I've seen it one time where a person is given whole blood. Whole blood is the red blood cells and the plasma, right? What is plasma? 
0.9% sodium chloride. So if they're losing blood, you can give them saline IVs until you can find out their blood type. Tell me you got that. So when you give people blood, you give them what's called packed red cells. So they get some lackey in the lab to take the whole blood, go outside, spin it around, and centrifuge the red cells off the plasma. And they take the red blood cells and they package them in a little plastic bag. And that's what they give the patient when they give them a transfusion. You, you got that? So watch. And explain something to you. A person with type B blood, can you give them type A blood? Why? Why can't you do that? Let me explain it to you again. You have a person with type B blood. Can you give them type A blood? The what? So what? What does a person with type B have floating in their plasma? Type A antibodies. So if you give a person with type B, type A blood, the antibodies that are floating in that person's blood with type B blood will attack that blood and it's a mess. You, you have what's called disseminated intravascular coagulation, right? You don't even want to, the name sounds bad. You don't want it. So can you do that? Now, can you give a person who is type A, type B blood? No, for the same reason, right? So watch, now watch. Can you give a person who is type AB, can you give them A blood? Yes, yeah, she can, right? Because let's go back. You got to have a specific antigen and a specific antibody. In a person with type B blood or type AB blood, what's floating in their plasma? No antibodies. So if you have no antibodies, can you get a transfusion reaction? No, you can't. Say yeah. Can a person with type AB get O blood? Yes, they can. So this meets both criteria. No antigens and no antibodies. That's why a person with type AB blood is the universal recipient. We ain't there yet, Sister Sledge. Hold up. Now watch, watch. <clears throat> Can a person with type A blood get O blood? Can a person with type A blood get O blood? No. Yes, they can, right? Because what did I tell you? You have to have a specific antigen and a specific antibody. And what you forgot immediately, of course, is that you don't give people whole blood. So you're not giving them the antibodies, you're just giving them the red blood cell. So if this is a ball-headed red blood cell, is there anything for the immune system to respond to, no. So can a person with type B blood get O blood? Can a person with type AB blood get O blood? That's why O is a universal donor. It's the rarest form. O negative is the rarest form. And O negative is the universal donor. O positive be can be given to people, but they have to be given a drug called Rogam. So they rub that on their hair and their hair grows back. <laughs> Rogam. Yes. O, o negative is the universal donor. AB positive is the universal recipient. They can receive any type of blood. And I'm not going to get into it now. But what's the only type of blood that a person who is O can they receive? They can only receive O. 
So if you have O blood, what do you have floating in your plasma? Both A and B antibodies. So if you give a person with type um, O, you give them A blood, the A antibodies are going to attack it. You give them B blood, the B antibodies are going to attack it. You give them A, B blood, it's a mess. Tell me you followed that. That's how it works. It can only get O blood. So that's why if you are O, they're always calling you on the phone. Always. And if you're O negative, you're like the paparazzi follow you. Because it is, that's the blood that you can, um, you can give to anyone. And O negative happens to be the rarest form of blood. Can I show you something just real quick? I'm going to show you. <clears throat> Do you know what type and cross match means? You hear it all the time on the shows. You ever watch the ER shows? No? No? Do you want to know what it means? Do you? <clears throat> watch. When a person comes in the emergency room and they're bleeding, you can't look at that blood and say, oh, that's A negative all day. Yeah. Order me up some. So what you have to do is you have to draw the patient's blood. And then based on that drawing that blood, they will look and they will determine the type. Right? Let's say it's A negative. Then they go to the blood bank and they find a bag of blood that says A negative. They say, hmm, we got some. That's exactly what they say. Mm. So what they will do then is they will take a little bit of the patient's blood in a Petri dish and mix it with the donor blood. You got me? And if it starts clotting and agglutinating, they failed the cross match. That's you type it, then you cross match that blood with the blood that you're going to give. That's the cross match. Say so, yeah. See, so now when you watch the show, they'll say type and cross match, right? For six units. Right, that's bad. Because if you get if you have your own blood, right? Right? And you take your own blood out and put it back in, should it be clotting? No. So that's why if you know you're going to have elective surgery, they tell you to donate your blood so that you can get that transfused. They also have a situation called auto transfusion, where they collect the blood um, that's drained out of you and they collect it in the container and then they put it in a bottle and they retransfuse it into you. That is auto transfusion. Say, so, yeah. did you follow that even remotely? Yeah. Do you know about the RH factor and RH incompatibility? Do you want to know about it? No. Nope. What's that? Yeah, you can learn about that on your own. Well, because you can read a book. Well, give me some money. I need more money. Do you want to know how it works real quick? It's like five minutes. Yeah. You know what they do, too, is they make these classes three hours when most people's attention span is about three seconds. That's really true. Well, what are you going to do, right? Do you want to come here four times a week for a 50-minute class? No. What's that? Yeah, I know. Yeah. I don't know how that works. I have to I have to read this really quick before I can go over it with you. But back in the day when they first started doing blood transfusions, people were getting delayed transfusion reactions, and they couldn't figure it out. You got me? They were typing the blood correctly, but these people were still getting these delayed transfusion reactions. So they looked, and on the red blood cell, 
they found a factor called the RH factor. It's called, it's the RH factor because when they drop some blood into a Reese peanut butter cup, that blood clotted right away. So that's why it's called the rhesus factor. It was first discovered in rhesus monkeys. That's why it's called the RH factor. You got me? I could have sold that. Yeah, I could have. Yeah. You don't even know some of the stuff that I said. I could be just totally lying to you. Now watch. 85% of the world's population is RH positive. So that's dominant. Now, if you're RH negative, what don't you have? You ain't got the RH factor. Tell me you got that. So watch. If you give somebody who is RH positive, right? Who cares what their blood type is? Can they receive RH negative blood? Why would you say yes? But what I'm talking about is, can you give a person, oh, here, here, I'll make it up. This is a positive blood. Can you give a person who is a positive, a negative blood? That's why it's that was so important. Wait, where is it? Where's the blood thing? <clears throat> oh, I erased it too. Well, uh, so you wrote it down. I bet you did, right? What do you need to get a transfusion reaction? Specific antigen, specific antibody. Ain't that right? Okay, good. <clears throat> Can the immune system react to nothing? Disregard that right there. Can the immune system react to nothing? No, it's going to react to something that is foreign right? An antigen. Say yes. So in a person who is A positive, a person with who's A positive, you can give them A negative blood because if you're RH negative, you don't have the RH factor. So there's nothing for your immune system to attack and recognize. Yes, but of course, I always want that corresponding explanation. There's nothing for the immune system to respond to. So watch. And again, this is high level thinking. I mean, it is. And that's why you need to understand this, right? Can you give a person who is A negative, can you give them R, um, A positive blood? Why? The person with A negative blood does not have the RH factor, right? So if you give a person who is A negative, A positive blood, the person who is A negative, their immune system is going to say, what the hell is that? And they are going to build up antibodies and you will get a delayed transfusion reaction.
Yes, they don't. They don't. So if you are a positive, you can get a negative or a positive blood. If you are a negative, you can only receive a negative blood. Does that make sense? Did you? No. Okay. Ambulate home. All right, we're going to go over the kidney next. Uh, pin out the kidney and uh, pin out the kidney and the skin. Yeah. So what's today? The eleventh, right? So um, Monday lab day. Yep. Uh, Wednesday we're going to go over the kidney and the uh, skin. Yeah. And then um, when the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, we do in fact have class. All right. So that following Wednesday, print off the um, uh, nervous system, nervous system and special senses. Yeah, the 12 cranial nerves, right? You're going to learn those on the, the day that we come back from uh, the little Thanksgiving break that Monday. The first thing we're going to do in class is you're going to take the 12 cranial nerve test. You got me? I explained that to you, right? You're going to tell me the 12 cranial nerves in order, the name, whether they're sensory, motor, or both, and you're going to tell me their basic function, right? Okay, rock on. But nothing Saturday here. No one. Say what? Uh? What's that? Oh. Um. Any, if you're RH positive, you can receive RH positive or RH negative blood. Or positive. If you are RH negative, you can only receive blood that is RH negative. That is really important. You know? Right, so you can receive A positive or A negative blood. That's correct. Yeah? Come on. In general? Yeah, it was had to be in general. In advance? Oh, you did your blood typing? She's teaching three uh, advanced AMPs next semester. Um, Dar, no. It's like, I want to uh, give up those general classes. I'll take some more advanced. You know what I'm saying? I'll teach the hell out of that class. Oh, yeah, no, uh, we talk, but I'm not, yeah, I'm not really, I'm not really uh, um, close to her. She looks at me. Okay, be good. She looks at me like I'm crazy. Here's the thing. What people do is they equate a teacher who is good based on how easy they are. No, um, I'm not. I try not to be, right? I actually, like, try to... Um, to teach you guys something. Uh, do you, you follow? Yeah. 